Okay, guys, here's the BC 2000, what I consider a really action-packed accessory to pair up with the CP2000 base station radio. As you can see, this is a frequency counter. This frequency counter came about at a time when it was considered a real luxury to even have a digital display on an amateur radio. It's got a two-position antenna switch. It's got an antenna tuner capable of handling 400 watts. And it's also got a very functional receiver preamp, as well as a 12-hour and a 24-hour military standard time clock which was actually a useful accessory back then as a lot of react monitors I know for a fact the Great Lakes Coast Guard was monitoring 11 meters so having a 24-hour military standard time clock was actually a useful accessory so here's the back of the BC 2000 the hookups are pretty straightforward we've got this AC cord plug in here we've got a four pin low voltage Molex connector in case you want to run mobile operation We've got these three slide switches here for programming of the clock. We've got the antenna switch here for antenna number one, antenna number two. This is a great feature. It's a nice high quality switching network inside. You could be running a vertical such as IMAX on antenna number one, a horizontal beam on number two. That's pretty neat. Here's where your transceiver plugs in. This is where you will hook up the cable from the CPI to the BC2000 and enable the frequency counter. And this is an RF sample out that you could uh, hook up to an oscilloscope or something and monitor a waveform. So once again, a really nice, well thought out action packed device. Now, as you can see, fine tuning the sideband signal or an AM signal actually moves the frequency counter. This frequency counter actually does sense the circuitry within the radio. So here's a wonderful feature of the BC2000, the antenna tuner function. This was an extremely important feature back in the day. As prior to the release of the CP2000, we were stricken to 23 channels with a maximum transmitting frequency of 27.255 megahertz. A lot of antennas were fairly narrow banded back in the day. And once people started being able to go up to 27.405, channel 40, uh, they started showing SWR. Now, once again, I've got the antenna tuner switched off. We're going to go over here to the CP2000, and I've got it in the calibrate mode. We're going to check calibration of the SWR meter. You can see that it is calibrated. So now let's go ahead and look at the actual SWR with the antenna tuner switched out. Holy moly, showing over a 1 to 2 SWR match. Now I'm going to go ahead and flip the antenna tuner on. Look at that, almost flat. Now I'm going to dial it down even lower using this tuner. Most of today's better modern amplifiers have what is known as a tuned input, keeping solid state transmitters happy when looking into the amplifier. But for those that don't have a tuned input, which is about 90% of the older amplifiers, a device such as an antenna tuner is a real handy device and can really maximize forward swing as you're keeping your transmitter happier by having an antenna tuner employed. Uh, CPI has also built a wonderful um, television interference filter into this as well as the, the base station console providing even further harmonic attenuation. They've got a wonderful receiver preamp function on here. Got the receiver preamp in the off position right now. There I flipped it on. You can see a little bump in the S meter. I'm hoping we can get some weak signal stations here. There I've just turned the preamp on off on receiver preamp off as you can see this receiver preamp is quite useful provides a nice boost in received incoming signals yet doesn't amplify uh, white noise like so many of the lesser uh, receiver preamps tend to so here's the top side of the BC2000 with yet another wonderful circuit board designed by CPI with a very functional circuit flow, greatly helping the ability for one to troubleshoot should that need to occur. We've got a fairly substantial power supply here with some humongous 
3 amp rectifier diodes, a rather large filter capacitor, and that was absolutely essential to feed this power hungry TTL, also known as transistor transistor logic. This was state of the art technology back in the day. And you'll also see we've got a 2 amp glass fuse hidden under what used to be clear tubing here. Okay, this is the underside of the BC2000. I want to start by showing you this TO3 case transistor. This is the voltage regulator that provides the 5 volt supply to the very power hungry TTL circuitry I was talking about. These are the engagement and disengagement relays for the receiver preamp and all the adjoining circuitry here. We've got two IF coils for peaking the receiver preamp circuitry, and then we'll move on to the antenna tuner section. Even though the BC2000 antenna tuner is rated at 400 watts, my advice is don't go there. Palstar makes an auto tuner for the amateur radio crowd that's rated at 10,000 watts. Are they worried an amateur radio operator is going to throw 10,000 watts into their antenna tuner? No. When initially tuning into an extreme mismatch, these air variable capacitors endure the forces and strains of much more than the actual wattage being fed into the, the tuner circuit. And the last thing you want to do is arc these air variable capacitors. It's pretty much game over when that happens as a phenomena known as carbon tracking occurs. Carbon tracking is the electrical equivalent of cancer. Once it's there, it's almost impossible to get rid of, and that is the biggest problem with both manual and auto tuners is people overpowering them, causing arcing, which creates sparking, carbon tracking, and it's a problem that only gets worse. And for those of you that are considering or actually own one of these and doing capacitor replacement, if you saw my first video on the CP2000, I mentioned there were some electrolytic capacitors hidden under the IF cans. In this case, yes, there is one hidden right under that IF can. Other than that, you're good to go.